but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. Here in your love Oh, there's nothing Better than you There's nothing Better than you, Lord There's nothing Nothing is better than you
Good morning. I see what Jay was talking about now. <laughs> There's something underfoot that's made some people get up and change. Wow, change, that nasty word. Hmm. Well, I hope that you're in the Christmas spirit. I'm not going to do as I would traditionally do. Um, and make an effort to go from A to Z from the first book of the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, to tell the Christmas story without getting to the Christmas story. So today I'm going to the Christmas story right from the get-go. So our text, as you see today, is Luke chapter 2, but today we're going to look at verses 1 through 20. Now I'm not going to go through every one of these verses and tell you little minute details about this. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to cover it with a big broad brush, and I want you to learn four things that are in Luke chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 20. I want you to learn these things. I want you to understand these things. I want you to remember these things. They sound elemental right now. They're just statements. They're just statements. They sound elemental right now, and you're going to say, I knew that, Pastor. You know, why, why, why are we talking about that? But it's all in the effort to answer the question, what manner of child is this? You know, I, <clears throat> I've been reading the Christmas story for a number of years like you have, and probably you have become very accustomed to it. And what I found is that familiarity with a topic or a reading or a text like this breeds a little bit of contempt. We'll skim through it and catch the highlights and we'll miss some of the great details that are just buried right underneath the surface, so to speak, to use an agricultural term or phrase. And so I want to not go real deep, but I want to get under the surface and answer the question, what manner of child is this? And these four statements or four answers to that come from the text today. And here they are. Number one, what manner of child is this, a babe born in a manger? They're like, I got it, Pastor. He's right here. Hold on. There's more to it than that. You know that. There's more to it than just the babe born in a manger. And we'll talk about that today. And what manner of child is this? Number two would be a Messiah in the making. A Messiah in the making. Now you say, a Messiah in the making? Yeah, Jesus didn't come as the Messiah except in title, but he was made to be the, the, you know, the Messiah that he became. And that's important for you and I to understand because that also applies to us in many ways. Number three, when we answer the question, what manner of child is this? He is a mystery or a mystery to be sought out. A mystery to be sought out. From the time uh, of, of, of Cain and Abel, even before then, uh, the first sin in the garden, there was a mystery that God propounded in the scripture. And all throughout the Bible, that mystery is unfolded piece by piece, like facets of a diamond being revealed. And even today, Jesus is a mystery to be sought out. And number four, what manner of child is this? Answer. A message to be shared. A message to be shared. He said, ah, you finally got to it. You're going to poke us in the side and say we need to do evangelism. Yes, I'm going to poke you in the side and say you need to do evangelism, but with a different twist today. Okay? And so I want you to be encouraged by all of these things. I want you to be comforted by these things. And I want you to be zealous for these things. And so without further delay, let's get to Luke chapter 2 where we're going to read a lengthy passage here. And I'm going to try to stumble through it with a little bit of congestion and drainage going on in my head today. And so with your copy of God's Word, <clears throat> Luke chapter 2, let's begin with verse 1. It says, Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. 
But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ, or who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying one to another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing which has happened which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were wondering at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen just as it or just just as had been told them. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you today that we have your words right before us. I pray, Lord, that the familiarity that we have with this passage would not be a stumbling block today and that we would be able to get under the surface of these words understand meaning and significance, encouragement and comfort, and also an admonition that we should be like these that were in this picture today in many ways. Lord, that there's much here that we could learn, but much that we should do in response to this learning. For it's in Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. I said there were four things in the response to the question, what manner of child is this? First answer is a babe born in a manger you see this in verse 7 look at verse 7 again and she gave birth to her firstborn son she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn one of the areas that Jesus is assaulted <coughs> of the two prominent areas is his humanity Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, Latter-day Saints attacked the humanity of Jesus, saying that he really wasn't a human being in all form. And what we see here are two phrases, she gave birth to her firstborn son. The phrase, uh, she gave birth, is a compound word, but literally it's used in every instance in the New Testament, 16 times, only two times is it used metaphorically for something else like James uses it in James 1 like to give or James 2 to give birth to sin but in every other instance whether it's man woman whatever we're talking about it talks about giving natural birth as we know natural birth today ourselves and so when it says she gave birth it's not possible that we should take that to be uh, some type of metaphor for some type of spiritual awakening or a spiritual beginning to a person that doesn't have a physical body that wasn't born through a womb of a woman when she gave birth this greek term it literally means to beget to to bring forth from oneself her firstborn son also is instructive because that's another compound word which means protos, which means first, and tikos or takos in, in the Greek means literally the first, firstborn of a mother. And so we have these two phrases that are tied together from the Greek and the word meaning, and it's not, it's not a, an option that Jesus was not a human being. He was not born of a woman, some would say, and that's a bunch of baloney, as they say in Greek. And so we see here that this was a babe born in the manger. And you say, okay, I've accepted that for years. What's the big deal, Pastor. Why are you preaching something that I always know? Well, I remember a pastor that always used to preach in his congregation say, well, pastor, why are you always preaching evangelistic messages? You know, you keep telling me this, that, and the other thing, and you take, accept Jesus Christ. He said, well, when you accept Jesus Christ, I'll stop preaching that message. I'm telling you that he was a babe in the manger because it's not insignificant. It's very significant. 
Because him being born in a manger gives him something that no other God that's in the pantheon of gods and humankind ever has. It's a relatability to you and me. You see, in the beginning, it says we ourselves were created imago dei in the likeness of God. But here God is taking on the likenesses of you and me. How astounding is that? Paul writing, the, Paul writing the Philippians in chapter 2 verses 5 through 11 literally says he set aside divine prerogative in order to be clothed with humanity in its fullness. The writer of Hebrews said that in his humanity he was tested just as we are yet without sin which is a huge thing because everything that we experience through our human nature, our fleshly nature, Jesus being born as a babe in a manger, he experienced that on earth. He understands us like no other does and we can relate to him like no other people could before the incarnation. It's important that he was a babe born into a manger. Think about this. The king of glory born in a feeding trough for animals. Can he relate to us in our poverty, in our weakness, in our destitute and depraved state of need? Absolutely. He was completely dependent just as we are as little infants on his mother, his father, his family. Whoever was around, he was completely and helplessly dependent upon them. We, we sang the song, you know, the cattle are lowing. And that, that, that almost hard to believe verse, no crying. No crying? Come on, he was a babe just like you and me. He wailed just like you and me. He had skint knees like you and me. He had hunger like you and me. He had diaper rash like you and me. He can relate to you and I like no other God. He was a babe born in a manger. Number two, what manner of child is this? He was a Messiah in the making. In the Old Testament, you have prophecy after prophecy, hundreds of prophecy that talked about the coming one. Daniel even talks about, uses the word Messiah in Daniel chapter 9. He gives a schedule of weeks until the Messiah will come. But he was born as a babe. Does that look like, does that sound like, does that feel like, does that appear like a Messiah? It says in, in, in the scriptures, after you read through Luke chapter 1, 2, and 3, you hear this idea of him growing up just like you and me. He was being made into a man from an infant, from a child, just like you and me. He was being formed and fashioned into the Messiah. The king of glory was being formed and fitted. He set aside his divine prerogative, and it says that he grew in wisdom and stature among men. His father at his baptism said from above, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. He didn't say that because he was perfect in every respect without any effort using divine prerogative from his birth to that day of his baptism. He struggled just like you and I. He was tempted just like you and I. Yet as the writer says of Hebrews, without sin. You see, that this Messiah in the making is a promise that God gave in Genesis 3.15 when, when this great sin had taken place. He brings down this whole quote about this one that would bruise the head of the serpent, yet the serpent would bite his heel. And the word that's used there is Zerah in the Hebrew, which means seed, means descendant. Right there. The first evangelical message of hope came after sin. It said that through the seed of a woman, there would be one that would come. Literally, you could translate it, crush the head of the serpent, the evil one, the symbol of the evil one. And it's not just that there's two elements there. Both of these elements, the serpent and the seed, they, they represent myriads of people of which you and I are a part of those myriads. He was a Messiah in the making. He began as a babe in the manger. He grew as a child. His father instructed him along the way. His parents raised him along the way. He was a Messiah in the making. Notice it says in Luke 2.11, For today in the city of David, 
there has been born for you a Savior. He was born to be a Savior or deliverer, you could say, who is Christ, which is the Greek equivalent to the Old Testament word Messiah. And then it says, the Lord or Master. He had these titles. He set them aside in order to learn and to become. Not only just to have a title, but to be what these titles represent. He was formed and he was fashioned by his Father and the Holy Spirit to be the Messiah. Number three, what manner of child is this? He is a mystery or a mystery to be sought out. The nation of Israel had been waiting a long awaited Messiah for thousands of years. From the time of, 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 of Abraham, from the time of the captivity in Egypt, from the time of their captivity in Babylon, they had been waiting for a Messiah that one day would make things right, that they, would, that they as a nation would ascend back up to prominence and be the apple of God's eye. They were waiting so long that they forgot what they really were waiting for. They forgot where the problem started, Genesis chapter 3. They forgot who the enemy was. You see, by the time Jesus arrives in 3 or 4 B.C., the way the calendar works out, it's a little funky there. Don't let that disturb you. By the time we get to Jesus' birth, what they were waiting for was a militaristic, political, charismatic leader that would free them from the Roman occupation there in Judea. That was never God's plan. And that's why they didn't recognize him, whether he was a babe or whether he was accused standing before Pilate, they never recognized who he was. Whether he was before the Sanhedrin or the council, or whether he was in the temple preaching and teaching, they could not recognize him because their Messiah looked like a pattern that they had made up in their mind according to their understanding of their greatest need, which was deliverance from occupied, being an occupied people by the Romans. What they had forgot was that the greatest enemy was the serpent, which is a symbol of that evil one, Lucifer, the bright morning star, the angel who fell because pride filled his heart. The original liar, the original murderer, the original usurper, the one that took myriads of angels with him in his fall. The one that tempted Eve, and think about this, the one that tempted Eve to sin against God by not believing and not obeying, not believing God's goodness and not obeying God's command, the one who tempted and brought sin into the world. So you have the tempter and the sin was God's original thing. Isn't it odd that God took sinful woman and said, through your seed, I'm going to bring one that will be the deliverer, the Messiah. That's our God. That should encourage you. He takes broken people and uses them to do his good will. That should encourage you a lot. And because he was as he, as he was, because he was a Messiah in the making, he was able to make something and make atonement for your sin and for mine. Hebrews says it like this. But he, meaning Jesus, having offered one sacrifice, that's him, himself on the cross having made one sacrifice for sins for all time sat down at the right hand of God Hebrews 10 12 one sacrifice Jesus paid it all Jesus paid it all for everyone that lived before him everyone who lived in his day and guess what you who are here today paid your sins in your past in your present and also in your future one sacrifice for all time. No more sacrifices because Jesus paid for all sins. Jesus freed you from your sin debt and now allows everyone who would to turn and to receive his grace. His free offer of salvation. Free to me but costly to him. Free to you, costly to God. What manner what manner, what manner, a mystery to be sought out. 
You know, even disciples were confused. Three years or thereabouts of ministry with Jesus, let's not knock the Jews all that hard. They didn't recognize Jesus either all the time. Sure, they knew he stilled the sea and the raging waves and the wind and the rain. And they thought to themselves, who is this guy? But in John 14, he's had the conversation Jesus is having with him. and says, I'm going away. And you know the way that I go, but you can't come. And one of the disciples says, we don't know the way that you go. Who are you talking about? Tell you what, Jesus, just show us the Father and we'll believe everything. And Jesus says this to him. He says, have I been with you so long and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show me the Father? Same thing happens with us today. We get busy in life. We think our Messiah, our deliverer, our provider is something that it's not. Someone that it's not. It might be money or finances or counselor. It might be a friend. It might be a spouse. Our ultimate provider, our ultimate deliverer is none other than Jesus. We do well to watch for that. Are we going to be <clears throat> seekers of the truth? You see, the shepherds had it together. The, the shepherds were the lowliest caste. If you went and you classified Israel as a caste system, they were on the bottom of the totem pole social, uh, social ladder. You know, they dealt with unclean animals, number one. Nobody wanted to be around them, number two, because of that. They couldn't go to the temple without purification rites, number three. So basically, they were unchurched Jews. Nobody wanted anything to do with them. And who did the message come to first? To the lowly shepherds. How did the shepherds react? Well, let's look. Verse 15. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. Jesus is a mystery to be sought out. Jesus is a mystery to be sought out. Here, in this text right here, it's the shepherds that have been announced uh, the birth of the Messiah, the Savior, the Lord. And they were curious, and they struck out immediately. Uh, Pastor Wayne uh, had preached a message, and you know Pastor Wayne sometimes likes to get you guys involved, and he'll say a word, and he'll say, say now say, you know, in this, it would be, say, immediately, 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 they got up, and they were curious, and they sought out this one, this mystery. The fear had gone away for who they were, where they were at on the social ladder, and they said, I don't care. We're going to go check this out. We're going to go find out. We're going to test the validity. We're going to find the truth in this. And so this one that we celebrate his birthday in this month of December, this one that we call the babe in the manger, we sing about this one that we call Lord and Master and Savior, this one that's called Messiah or Christos or Christ, which is the Greek equivalent to Messiah, this one is worthy to be sought out, a mystery to be sought out by many. And as a matter of fact, in, in the beginning of the church, there were those that were skeptical of this message of Jesus' resurrection, his birth, his virgin birth, all of these things, they were skeptical. And some of them were like some of us. They just put it off. There were some of them that th thought it was laughable and they, they just dismissed it. But yet, there's another group that's in the scripture that were very much like these shepherds. We, we learn about them in Acts chapter 17. Paul is, is, is in, in, in Athens here in Acts chapter 17. And he's moving around Greece. And he went to Thessalonica. And they basically stoned him out of Thessalonica. And he comes to this little town uh, of Berea. 
And, and we read in verse 11 in chapter uh, 17, it says, Now these, meaning the, the, those who were Bereans, the Bereans were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. You know, you know the, the difference between a cynic and a skeptic is this. The cynic won't even look at the evidence, won't consider the evidence. The, ske- the cynic has made their mind up. But the skeptic, at least an honest skeptic, is going to look at the evidence. And the Bereans, they examined the scriptures to see if these things were so. The shepherds, they received the message from angels and they examined the evidence to see if what the angels said was so and they found it to be that way exactly as the angels had told them what about you are you here today just because it's something to do that you were raised to do to come to church to be a certain place at a certain time on a certain day and you've never examined to see if it was so do you really believe in the virgin birth Do you really believe in the crucifixion, the resurrection? Have you examined it to see if it is so? Number four, what manner of child is this? A message to be shared. These shepherds, they're pretty cool. They are pretty cool because they got it right. Everything they did was exactly right. They went to Mary and Joseph and found Jesus there. And after leaving it, they got it right the whole way they went along. And it says in verse 17, after or when they had seen this, they, and they made known the statement which they had been told about the child. So not only did they find it like it was, they told them what they had been told. They shared, they had made known what had been revealed to them. And then look at verse 18. And after all these things were said and done, All who heard it wondered at these things which were told to them by the shepherds. And then it says in verse 19, but Mary treasured these things. She's pondering these things in her heart. And then the shepherds get it right again here. It says, the shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen. Just as had been told them. What were they glorifying? Who were they glorifying? They were glorifying God for the arrival of the Savior, the Christos, the Messiah, the Master, the Deliverer. They were singing his praises. They were speaking about him. They were basically doing something that we don't do all too often ourselves, praising our Savior all the day long. Everywhere we go, they got it right. Here's, th- here's four things that I want as action items for your mind, for your, uh, write these down if you don't write anything else down. Four things as a consequence to this message today, as a consequence to this scripture today that you need to remember. That you need to, number one, be encouraged by a babe born in the manger. Why? Because God is like us because he was born in a manger as a babe. You should be encouraged by that. You should be encouraged that you can relate to him and he can relate to you because of that. Number two, uh, that, that, that you should be encouraged that he was a Messiah in the making because guess what? You are an object of God's love and compassion and zeal and you also are a person in the making. The scripture tells us in, in Romans chapter 8 that for, for whom he pr- foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of his only son. God is in the process of making you like Jesus, in other words. Are you done yet? Absolutely not. Am I done yet? Absolutely not. But he is working you you can have great confidence that he is working in your life to bring you to a place today that you're more like Jesus today than yesterday and likewise more like Jesus tomorrow tomorrow than today you should have great confidence that should encourage you 
And also, because of this, because he was a Messiah in the making, he relates to us in a way that makes him empathetic toward our needs. When, when he was speaking in John 10, he said this way. He said, I am the door. And if anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. For, for in sheep terms, that means to have a good day, to have good nourishment, to have good rest, have protection. The thief comes but to kill, steal, and destroy. The, who's the thief? Lucifer, Satan, the devil. All of his little minion angels, the fallen angels. They, they don't want to come to bring you happiness, joy, and peace, and security in the eternal respect. They want you to, to take the placebo that they offer right now, the, the, the sugar water right now, rather than the, the, the dinner and, and the wine and the wedding feast that awaits you as a child of God. The thief comes but to kill, steal, and destroy. I came that they may have life. And have it abundantly. That's no kind of life that we, we really know tangibly. What he means is I came to give you eternal life. And if you have been born again, if you know Jesus and Jesus knows you, you already have this eternal life. You don't know what it feels like. It's not realized in you, but you already have eternal life. There's nothing else to do. There's no sin that you'll ever sin, no word that you'll ever say, no deed that you won't ever do, no deed that you'll refrain from doing that will keep you from the love of God. It is a done deal. The, sin's been, the sin debt's been paid for. You've been adopted. Remember in, in Galatians, we talked about that. And, and in Galatians 4, that idea, that Greek adoption idea is, is that nothing can take you from being the adopted son, the adopted daughter. Your future is secure. And be encouraged. What do we see when we talk about the mystery to be sought out? Be comforted. Because when you diligently seek him, guess what you find? In the Old Testament, Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, 13, a great verse, 29, 11, and 13, uh, we often quote them. And so let me quote 29, 13. You will seek, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Does that mean you have to work for your salvation? Oh, no. Part of the reason Jesus was, came to be incarnate was that finding him would be oh so much easier. The reason that we have the word, both the Old Testament and New Testament, is to reveal and explain who the Father is and his will for you and for me. To be found by the great shepherd. To be a sheep of his fold. And it says, you seek him with all of your heart, diligently, and you will find him. Not maybe find him, but you will. He's a mystery to be sought out. Jesus spoke similarly in, in, in Matthew chapter 7. He says, ask, seek, and knock, and you will find. And it will be open to you. The way the Greek is written there that each one of those verbs, ask, seek, and knock, is keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. And you will find. It will be open to you. That idea of openness is in that idea that was expressed earlier. I am the door, Jesus said. I am the door. And if you come in through me, you'll find rest. You'll find pasture. You'll find eternal life. What manner of child is this? A message to be shared. Now I'm going to shock some people today. No, I'm not going to tell you to close your eyes and go to sleep. I know that's dangerous. But I'm going to tell you to do something that you've never been told to do in church before. And you're saying, well, I just want to hear that. What manner of child is this? A message to be gossiped. The shepherds went about not only that night, but I'm thoroughly convinced after what they had seen that they could not help but to talk or to gossip, to speak continually about what they had experienced. I'm telling you, 
as Dr. Bennett used to say, when he looked at the book of Acts, he said there was nothing particular about what happened in Acts. There was no evangelism program of study. There was no training seminars. There were no flashcards. There were no memorization verses. They simply went about gossiping the gospel. How simple does it get? That's alarmingly simple. They just talked about what they experienced. What about you? What have you experienced? Have you experienced Jesus? I spoke with several people in the last two weeks, and and, and the bottom line is this. We can know about Jesus, but do we have an experience with Jesus? Do we know him and he knows us? He said again in Matthew 7, there will be many that come to me today and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we, you know, give clothes to the naked and and, and give water to the the thirsty? And he'll say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. If you're here today and you know that you have a relationship with Jesus, you should be praising all the day long. You should be glorifying him all the day long. You should be gossiping about him all the day long. But if you don't, you should be like those verses that are in John chapter 1. He came into his own and his own received him not. And when I say came into his own, remember that John's writing, particularly in a Greek mindset there, God didn't want just to save Israel, but his plan was to save humanity all the time long. As a matter of fact, when you look at verse 32 here, it says that Jesus was really a light of revelation to the Gentiles. To be shown to them, to illumine them, to help them understand that God's grace is now available to them. And guess what? You're a Gentile. I'm a Gentile. And if you don't know Jesus today, please, 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 don't go home without calling, writing, asking someone, me, a friend, whatever, what it means to have a relationship with Jesus today. I want to say one last thing about what the shepherds did and how they did it. They went about gossiping, but the manner of their gossip was that they were praising and giving glory to God. Perhaps one of the greatest ways that that we can evangelize the world around us today is not door-to-door evangelism, though that's not bad and it will work on when the Lord wants it to work. But one of the easiest ways to do that is to praise and to glorify God, to sing his praises, extol his greatnesses, to have it on our faces, to have it in our words when we interact with other people that would prompt them to ask us for the reason of the hope that's within us. You don't need no class to do that. I don't need a class to do that. It's simple. So today, what manner of child is this? To you, who is Jesus? Is he something you've just read about? Or is it a person that you experience on a day-to-day basis? That's the question for the invitation today. I've given you four points and four action items. Great encouragement and comfort to you. But the bottom line is this. Do you know Jesus? If not, today can be the day of salvation. As our musicians, as our pianists come to sing the invitation hymn today. Have you heard the message? That man is sinful. Paul said that no man seeks after God, no not one. If you have an inclination toward God, it's only because he, as John 6, says, no man comes to God except he draw him. That's because he's making an effort to come to you. The shepherd is making an effort to come to you. What's going to be your response today? I'll be down front to receive you. You come as the Lord leads.
Can we all stand for our invitation today?